Greetings! Today we're going to continue talking about the actual skeleton, more specifically the vertebral column and the bony thorax. In front of us we see the vertebral column, so we'll start talking about it first. Now, the vertebral column is made up of three vertebra types. One, cervical vertebra, two, thoracic vertebra, and three, lumbar vertebra. Notice that I mentioned cervical vertebra most superiorly. Okay, so how do I remember this? Well, I remember that I wake up at seven o'clock in the morning, every morning, so therefore I have seven cervical vertebra. Then I have lunch at 12, therefore I have 12 thoracic vertebra. And then I have dinner at 5 every day, 5 p.m. So that's one way of remembering them. So we have seven cervical vertebra, wake up at 7, 12 thoracic vertebra, we have lunch at 12, and then we have dinner at 5, hence lumbar vertebra. So here are our seven cervical vertebra, our 12 thoracic vertebra, are five lumbar vertebra, but let's not forget that part of your vertebra, you also have, we also have the sacrum, okay? And we also have the coccyx. So I don't have um, a technique to remember these two, but uh, we'll talk about this in laboratory. Now the vertebra has normal curvature. So the cervical vertebra tend to form this curvature that we refer to as being more anteriorly. So the curvature is more anteriorly, and I'm exaggerating with my straw here, okay? Uh, in the thoracic vertebra, in this model, you can see it more pronounced, so I don't have to exaggerate. Here you have a curvature that is more posteriorly for the thoracic vertebra, and as we move inferiorly and we arrive at the lumbar vertebra, you see that the curvature is more anteriorly again, and as we arrive here over to the sacrum, the curvature is more posteriorly. Now these are normal curvatures. Now there's such a thing as abnormal curvatures. And these abnormal curvatures known as, are known as kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. Now kyphosis is an abnormal curvature of the thoracic vertebra. So the curvature would be more out this way. So kyphosis, kyphosis would be what we often refer to as being hunchback, all right? Now, lordosis, I usually tend to think of Lord of the Rings, and I think of Gandalf and holding his back because he's so old, and so having pain in the lumbar vertebra, so therefore that must be where lordosis takes place. So that would be a pronounced and exaggerated curvature of the lumbar vertebra and would be out this way. Now, scoliosis is another abnormal curvature that we can see in individuals. And scoliosis would be an exaggerated, exaggerated curvature of the, the uh, thoracic vertebra, but it would, it would be a lateral curvature. So it could be a lateral curvature on this side or on that side. And there are different, different versions of that or severity of those, of course. Now, in viewing the vertebral column laterally, we notice that there are holes in between each vertebra, all right? Holes and in between, hence intervertebral foramina. You can see these holes throughout the entire vertebra. They're more obvious as we move more inferiorly on the vertebral column, all right? And through these holes, you can see that there are these structures coming through, and these are actually known as spinal nerves. So we have these spinal nerves traveling through both sides. So we have intervertebral foramina throughout on both sides of the vertebral column. Keep that in mind, please. In addition, we have these beautiful structures that provide cushion made up of fibrocartilage, which is a type of cartilage. Uh, so here you see these intervertebral discs that are in between the vertebra. So you see an intervertebral disc you see a body of a vertebra, intervertebral disc, body of vertebra, intervertebral disc, body of vertebra, etc. 
in this particular model, uh, we're attempting to demonstrate to our students that this structure is representing what is referred to as a slip disk or a herniated disk. And what that means is that the material in the center of the intervertebral disk has essentially come out, has squeezed out <clears throat> for one reason or another, <clears throat> excuse me. And the problem here is that you can see that this material squeezing out is actually causing an issue with this structure here, which is your spinal nerve. So this is the cause of the horrendous pain that individuals will feel when they have a herniated disc. Or sometimes people say, oh, my back went out. Now, in addition to seeing this problem in this model, you can see it in this other beautiful model that we have here. You can see the intervertebral foramen. Here you see one of them. And you see the herniated disc as well, all right? In addition, you see the body of the vertebra here, okay? And here's the spinal nerve on both sides, of course. So you can see it on both sides because we have intervertebral foramina on both sides of the vertebra. Now, vertebra have important landmarks that we can discuss. So let's discuss this vertebra as a generic vertebra. So a vertebra, will a vertebra will have a body, so body of a vertebra. It will have a vertebral foramen. Remember, foramen means whole. It will have transverse processes on the sides, all right? It will have a spinous process that is pronounced, and, and it will have superior and, and inferior articular processes. So this structure here, okay, the structure here is a superior articular process and you have them inferiorly as well. You can see it here, all right, inferior articular process, okay? Now let's talk about a special vertebra, one of my favorites. Um, well, they're all my favorites. Uh, anyway, uh, this is referred to, this vertebra is actually a cervical vertebra and this vertebra is the first vertebra in a vertebral column known as the atlas, okay? So hence uh, C1, C for cervical. Uh, you know that it is also a cervical vertebra because it, it has those little holes here which are your transverse foramina, okay? All right, here is the vertebral foramen. Now this vertebra is actually the vertebra that interacts with the skull immediately, but it interacts with it superiorly. And this vertebra will interact with another vertebra inferiorly, and that vertebra will be the axis. One way of remembering this vertebra is of thinking of uh, Atlas, the one who held the weight of the world. A really unique feature of the Atlas is that it allows us to carry out a specific movement with our head. And it allows us to move our head uh, down and up, okay, making that motion as if you're agreeing with someone, all right? One landmark or feature that is not found in the cervical vertebra is that it doesn't have a body. So that's one thing unique about this vertebra as well. Another one of my favorite vertebra is C1, which is the axis. So this vertebra is inferior to the atlas. And a unique feature that this vertebra has is that it has something referred to as the dens. So this looks like a thumb, like thumbs up is what I think of, okay? Thumbs up, all right? And again, here's the vertebral foramen, spinous process. And if we look laterally, because remember, this is a cervical vertebra. Okay, let's get it into focus here and cervical vertebra, so it must have those trans, that transverse foramen there. There's one on the other side as well, of course, and you can see it is more obvious on this side. Now, thanks to the dance, this very unique vertebra allows us to make a movement with our, with our head as well. It allows us to move our head left and right, so that's another very uh, unique aspect of this vertebra. Now, I don't want you to get confused when you see different, uh, different thoracic vertebra, and uh, you will notice that even though these two vertebra look different, slightly different, 
they are still thoracic vertebra. How do I know that the one here is not, this vertebra that I'm holding is not a cervical vertebra? It's because it does not have transverse foramina. You can inspect it on both sides. It doesn't have that, all right? But it does have that very long spinous process. That's one um, unique feature seen in thoracic vertebrae is that they have a very long spinous process. That can be more obvious seen in uh, the ones in the model here. And you can see that as you move more superiorly, that spinous process, it it's actually projects more posteriorly. But as you move inferiorly, the spinous process actually projects inferiorly. All right, and these thoracic vertebra are the vertebra that actually are interacting with the ribs and are within the area of where the thoracic cage is located or bony thorax. All right, going back to the vertebra here on the table, I want you to notice a couple of things. So notice that the body of the thoracic vertebra is very small, still very small. Uh, this, of course, is the vertebral foramen in both, right? Um, the superior articular facets. So facets, think of a face. The process is the structure itself. Okay, so don't get confused about that. Here are the transfer processes and here's the spinous process. Okay, the really cool thing about the, um, the thoracic vertebra is that they remind everybody of a giraffe. So think of the zoo when you see this vertebra. All right, so that will help you remember them. All right. Now, this is a lumbar vertebra. The lumbar vertebra always make me smile because it makes me think of a moose, all right? I hope that reminds you of a moose. Uh, this particular model or specimen is, is really cool because you can actually appreciate, you can actually appreciate the spongy bone. Do you see the spongy bone? So this is actually a real vertebra. So you can see the spongy bone. You see the porosity here. And if I go sideways, you can see the compact bone out here. Unique features of the lumbar vertebra are that it has, they tend to have a larger body than any other vertebra, and they tend to be thicker, just larger all around. And they also have a spinous process that tends to be blunt, hatchet-like, if you would. It still has those uh, superior articular facets right in processes but if you look at if you look at the actual model here you'll notice you'll see the lumbar vertebra you see that spinous process quite different from the thoracic vertebra now let's focus on the superior articular facets found in the lumbar vertebra they are found here and here and the inferior one is found here and on the other side, of course. But this is difficult to discern, quite frankly. If we look at the actual model, we can appreciate it more. So let's focus on this vertebra here. This is a lumbar vertebra. This is another lumbar vertebra. So right here, you see the superior articular process and the area where it interacts with the vertebra superiorly would be this area that would be the superior articular facet. So the interaction between this vertebra here superiorly with this one inferiorly would be the inferior articular facet. So I hope that makes sense. It's not, this is not geared to confuse you in any way. So this is superior, right, at top, and this would be inferior, all right? Now let's talk about the bony thorax or thoracic cage. So here is our thoracic cage cage or bony thorax, this, this whole region here, all right? And remember that this cage has a very important function that is protecting the organs that are inside here, like the heart, our lungs, our right and left lungs, all right? So a very important bone here um, is the sternum, which is this whole bone. However, the sternum is composed of three bones, which are the manubrium, which is this whole region here, the body of the sternum, which is this region here, and the siphoid process. Now, within the manubrium, we have two important bony landmarks, which are, or structures, which are the jugular notch and the clavicular notch seen here. So here's your clavicle, hence there's the notch for each one, right? 
So this is the the uh, the clavicular notch, but this is the right clavicular notch. This is the left clavicular notch. In the body of the sternum, we have another important landmark or structure that is found here, and this would be referred to as the sternal angle. And the sternal angle is right here. Let's see if we can focus a little bit better. Here we go. And you can see the sternal angle here. That denotes where your second rib is attached to. And this can see, be seen even better. I don't know, I'm partial to the real skeleton, okay? So that can be seen better right here. When it comes to our ribs, we actually have the seven, the first seven pairs, because we have one on each side, right? This first seven pair are actually known as the true ribs. And they're true because they are directly attached to, to, the, to the sternum. Now, then we also have false ribs, and those would be the lower five pairs. Then we have floating ribs, and that would be the last number 11 and 12 pairs. All right, and how do I remember this? I start at the bottom, quite frankly. I start with number 12 and number 11. So there's 12 floating around. See how it floats, right? Okay, and so this is 12 and this is 11. Then I move superiorly and I can actually count the false ribs and I count them from this one here, which that would be one and then I go up and I count five. Um, so in the other ones, I just count the two ribs. I start at the top and I just start with number one here, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Well, I hope you enjoy that and it's helpful to you so that you can be prepared for lab. Take care. Bye.